how do we get to a point where firefighters have standardized training so that they're all doing this the same way and they're all learning the same things in terms of dealing with these fires? You know, this, um, as you allude to, it is a patchwork and, and that is absolutely true because we continue to learn. I keep talking about research on purpose because we have to have the continuing research. We don't know what we don't know. And so some of our research partners are forcing these incidents in labs, in and understanding and experiments what is happening so we can learn quickly because we don't want to just wait for an incident to happen and learn from those. And so our research is very forward thinking. And so from that, then we are also researching on which of those methods for suppression is going to be the best. Given that, we're still learning. And so this is not unlike other things that we've done in the past, whether it is uh, with hazardous materials and understanding what kind of suppression material to use on which type of uh, chemical fire, uh, whether it is in an EMS arena, for example, what is the protocol that is best for certain symptoms or what we're seeing in the field. So this type of learning and the first response arena is uh, not unlike what we've done in the past. We, as I said, are all hazards. We are there, we are innovative, and this is across the board for firefighters and paramedics uh, across our nation. We are there, we're gonna show up, we're gonna perform, and we're gonna put our basic skills uh, into play and learn as we go. And so this is, this is the state right now. We will move forward and this will continue to improve just as we've done with other innovations in the past. And you know, when you talk about research, data as part of that research. Right now, anecdotally, the, the, the feeling is that EV fires, lithium ion battery fires are relatively rare. They are spiking in certain areas, like you mentioned in New York, for example. How do we collect the data to get a sense of how big of a problem this is becoming? And as we move into the EV future, we imagine this will become a bigger problem on the roads in the United States. So let me address the data piece first. Um, that's, I, this is a fantastic question because data is gonna drive our research, right? Which is where we're really focused right now. Today, we are working with a legacy system at USFA. Part of our legislative intent is that we are to hold a national fire data system for data. Uh, this legacy system today cannot track these types of events. This is why we know so little about how many incidents we've had. We have documented from media that there's a little over 500 of these incidents um, since about 2021. Before that, there were none that we know of. Given that, we are modernizing that capability. Right now, we are in a project where we are building a cloud-based near real-time data capture system so that we know when these incidents are happening, um, we can inform those incidents and even be able to translate, hopefully soon, the research and lessons learned into that moment to advise on-scene fire suppression information about that incident, be able to feed that right back to the fire department that is responding in that moment. And so that's the kind of technology that we're building. Data is going to be key to that to be able to inform uh, decision-making. And so this is something that's ongoing. Today, I wish we knew more. We don't, but we are addressing that. And this is something too, that uh, the Biden-Harris administration has leaned into science. We're leaning into technology, we're leaning into data. And so the US Fire Administration is taking that forward uh, and being very bold uh, with our innovation in building what we're gonna call the National Emergency Response Information System or NEARS. So, Take a look at that, it's uh, available. Um, people can look and see what that's gonna entail because we'll also have a public facing dashboard from that system. Uh, you know, it's not a new issue, right? We've been talking about this for more than 10 years. We know there have been safety standard summits held um, as early as 2010, maybe even before that, when it comes to the potential safety hazards and risks that come with EV fires, for example. Why has it taken so long to, to, to get this research to get this data to understand this problem before it creeps up on us? Well, I think a lot of that was that we are driven by incidents that occur. You know, it is our nature as humans that we 
are complacent. We think things are, are good right up until they are not, right? And so innovation is fantastic right up until there's an incident that says we have a problem. And so, or a challenge, maybe not even a definition of a problem, but maybe we have a challenge that we need to understand. And so I think that's what's taken so long. The innovation was good. These products are fantastic. It's just a matter of on occasion, they can be damaged. That might lead to um, a, a situation, particularly with the battery. Or we have aftermarket chargers that people buy and plug them in. This was something that was not seen at the beginning. And these aftermarket chargers cause the cells to overcharge, which leads to the thermal runaway we've talked about. And so I think that innovation, we have to, we assume that it's good. Uh, until we have an incident. And usually it is something that is either damaged or um, a human behavior that causes an incident with the innovation. And that's what we're seeing here. And so this is why it has taken this long to see these incidents happen. And now because of the lack of policy, lack of regulation, because we simply don't know yet everything we need to know so that we can enforce and put in place some regulation um, to stop these kinds of, of events. So I really think that it is a, an appropriate evolution of what has occurred, and we are on path to intervene, to reduce the risk, and to better understand and implement practices for suppression when these events do occur. In many cases, uh, fire protection standards sort of go, fall to the state and the local municipalities. In New York, for example, you mentioned they, they passed a law um, recently that will go into effect in September that would penalize people um, who do not use certified UL chargers with their products. Do more safety standards need to have regulations like that at the federal level? Can that even happen? You know, that's excellent what New York has done, and they have really pushed forward on the regulation of particularly aftermarket chargers. And why? Because that's what they're seeing. Back to the lessons learned post-incident. And so when we have those lessons, then we can act on them. And so that state regulation is incredibly important. Now what we need to do is have other states pick that up, but also federal regulation and certainly can occur. We need these lessons. We need the evidence back to the data. We need the data to inform policy, to inform regulation. So yes, this type of regulation can occur at all levels of government. You know, you, we talk about sort of federal safety standards in the vehicle, the automotive industry, for example, GM told us obviously there are regulations when it comes to crash testing their vehicles for safety, but there are no regulations for fire protection when it comes to those vehicles. They voluntarily provide these emergency response guides, but should there be federal regulations for fire protection and fire safety when it comes to electric vehicles? You know, as we move along and again, learning from research, and you just mentioned the guides for first responders, and those are ever evolving, uh, depending on what the automotive um, manufacturers develop and how they change the vehicles, how they change the batteries, where the batteries are in each of the vehicles, all of these things change uh, very rapidly, in fact, as they are continuing to innovate, as they learn themselves. And so we as first responders, often are looking up in the moment, uh, what are those guides on any particular vehicle that is uh, or may have an incident, perhaps a crash, for example, that might have led to uh, one of these events. And so that kind of innovation is important. Um, I think that as we continue to learn, yes, we can inform and we'll identify places for regulation. I think we need to understand and have more information, more data, uh, certainly more outcome research on the incidents that do occur before we can inform policy and regulation. Right now, we're not even sure what to regulate because we don't know enough about the incidents that are happening. And so as we continue, yes, our information, our data, our research will inform policy and regulation. NFPA maintains a list of about three dozen ERGs from various manufacturers that firefighters can use, first responders, second responders can use to understand what they're dealing with. Why hasn't there been a centralized location outside of NFPA's website, maybe an app for ha perhaps from a, a government agency from the federal, from the federal government that, that allows first responders and second responders to find that information in real time as quickly as possible that continues to get updated. As you mentioned, there are many updates from the manufacturers. Why haven't we, from a government standpoint, created something that makes it easier for first responders to access those emergency response guides? I think that's a, a fantastic idea and perhaps something that we will 
add to the nearest system that I mentioned so that real-time innovation is there. There are apps that are available. Each of the manufacturers have their own apps that have these readily available. And so if we have the information about the vehicle before the arrival of the first responders on scene, then they have the time to have that at their fingertips. This is something that we've got the innovation there. We just need to be able to leverage it. And so certainly implementing that in a near real-time response uh, capability in a data system is something that we should do. And certainly something that we are considering as part of the nearest system that I mentioned. And then ultimately, is there one agency that takes the lead or is responsible for making sure that firefighters, uh, both, you know, professional firefighters, paid firefighters and volunteer firefighters, because that they get left behind a lot. They don't have the resources to pay for training, to get the training, to stay up to date. And when it comes to innovation, uh, that becomes a challenge for them in particular. Is there a, a lead agency that, that we should be looking to, to make sure that firefighters are trained, they have all the resources that they need to make sure that they can safely and effectively deal with these incidents? I love that question. Yes, for all firefighters, first of all, the training that we offer at the USFA and our National Fire Academy is always free. In fact, we pay them to come to campus and to learn. But as I mentioned to you, we don't do the suppression training per se. We give them the understanding of the chemistry. We treat it as a hazmat incident. We also train our fire investigators to understand evidence collection post-event. So all of that is always uh, free for all firefighters, career, volunteer, combination. Also, our researchers like UL Fire Safety Research Institute, for example, offers training online that's also free. So any firefighter can access that online training about lithium ion batteries. They leverage a lot of the lessons learned from New York. And so transitioning that information and lessons learned from FDNY down to any fire department via online vehicles is accessible right now and available for free to all firefighters. And so it is really a, a partnership across the whole of the fire service, both of the federal government and also our research partners, our nonprofit partners like NFPA, like UL uh, Fire Safety Research Institute. 